Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest today, Dr. Dambisa Moyo, and this is part two of our special two-part series, and we're pretty much exploring everything on the planet. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Aaron, for having me here. So let's let's start off with education and, and your take on the special challenges of education, uh, both here in the United States, but but in other countries as well. Yes. So um, the. First of all, I'm sitting here because of education. Um, as you are probably aware, I was born and raised in Africa. Um, without an education, I would not be here. And so, you know, Oxford might be. Yes, I went to Oxford. I also went, did my masters at Harvard. Those are, are great. That's where I did my masters. Fantastic. Well, that's great. <laughs> but I was not born in Africa. Oh well, I'm sorry. To, for, sorry to hear that. I'm uh, sorry. Well, yeah, <laughs> Pity for you. Um, but the point just being that without an investment in education, a lot of the challenges that the global economy is facing today, just we'll, we can't even have the debate to try and solve those issues. Um, you know, if you look at some of the reports, just to get a snapshot of where or how difficult the problem is, it's actually quite disturbing. And you did say, you know, the United States, but more generally, and of course, more generally matters. But the United States is the largest economy today, about $20 trillion GDP. Um, and in terms of helping to solve massive problems that the global economy is facing, whether it's the economy itself, geopolitical instability, issues around healthcare globally, issues around environmental and climate change concerns, the whole list of things around, um, around terrorism, around uh, innovation. Um, we need the United States to be firing on all cylinders. I mean, the global economy cannot just do it by itself because many of the challenges that are being dealt with there are of the low asset allocation type. So should we build a school, should we build a house? We need the United States to continue to be a leader in some of the more difficult challenges and more difficult questions questions that um, are really going to describe the world in the future, which is why education is critically important. If you don't have an education, educated population that's able to think or contribute to those types of discussions or to think innovatively, um, you are actually creating essentially a drag longer term um, on economic growth because we won't be able to solve this and so human progress comes into question. Now, traditionally, the United States has relied on immigration, but that is now coming into question. So the fact that we're not even going to be able to draw on talent internationally also means that um, the education question becomes problematic. Um, according to the OECD statistics, and there's something called the PISA statistics, the Program for International Students Assessment, worth having a look. If you've got children, grandchildren, or you just care about education, really worth having a look. This is a study that occurs approximately every three years, and they go around the world and they test um, students of the peers of a certain age um, in mathematics, in science, and in reading. And the United States and many other developed countries, United Kingdom, et cetera, were in the top ranks um, about 15 years ago. We're talking about in the first, number one, number two, number three. Today, they're in what I'd call the more bottom ranks, number 27, 28, 29. And we've seen a, a sort of escalation or really acceleration in improvements in many of the uh, developing countries, places like China, but you know Singapore and other places around the world. Now, some people might say, well, that's just great. That's just life. But as I said earlier, I think it's critically important, especially in STEM, STEM subjects, but even more generally in diplomacy, given the sort of difficulties that the global economy is in geopolitical geopolitical issues today, we do have to invest in this area in, in, in an efficient way. So it's not about just throwing money at the problem. Um, and, and, and I would argue also it's not about just protecting entrenched interests or so vested interests that actually may not be doing more harm or may not be actually helping the situation. It's about being crafting strategies that are much more effective um, at delivering high quality education so that we can generate a, a better output. What are some of those strategies? Because clearly we spend an extraordinary amount of money, especially on K through 12 education. Yes. Our higher education model differs from many countries as well. That's uh, you know, a, a, another challenging issue. Uh, what, what do you think are some things we could do that would really be effective in the K, kindergarten through 12th grade arena? So, I mean, I, I, I'm going to sort of sound slightly schizophrenic here because on the one hand, I do think that uh, what is missing, especially as somebody who came to the United States, uh, I feel a little bit like Alexis de, de Tocqueville, 2017, coming to critique the education system here. but. Um, I, I do think that there's probably not enough um, 
uh, quality at the very basic level of education. I mean, if you are growing up in a place like Africa, um, your basic education, and of course there are um, access issues, so let's just get that uh, out of the way, um, but you can get a very, very good education provided even by the government, um, which is not necessarily clear. There's just so much variability in the United States, and I think that there's a lot of people who are passing different stages but actually are not getting the basic um, training. I'm not a teacher myself, but I do spend a lot of interest, I have a lot of interest in this area. Um, so so, you know, that's one area. So I think the formal education aspect of it, critically important. Delivering um, high quality standards of formal education so people are able to compete on basic standards. The reason I was talking about schizophrenia is because on the other hand, the world has changed. The world is moving. Um, and therefore, education and how we deliver it is changing considerably as well. Um, what that means is that the formal sort of go to school and sit in a classroom model has been so disrupted that, that we have to think about more innovative ways um, of actually delivering an education um, and which is already happening. You've got the Khan Academies, you've got other formats. Um, I, I was just at Singularity University. They're talking about more innovative ways of delivering an education. Um, I think that, that has, we have not figured that out yet. Um, and I think that that's probably another area where people who are much more au okay fait in this area would say um, there's much more scope for delivering higher quality, potentially at a lower price point. Well, one of the challenges I think, I don't hear a lot of discussion, is that of expectations. Mm -hmm. And that where you have high expectations of students, I think you can see very significant increases in performance. And where you also have high expectations of parents. Yes. And I don't think in the United States, as a nation, we have high expectations of parents in terms of their involvement with educa the education of their children. So that's one area where there actually has been some interesting experimentation from public policy, and this is around incentives. So should we, are parents just so frazzled and busy just trying to create a living, decent living for their children that perhaps they're not able to deliver the amount of focused, um, diligent hard work around uh, the delivery of, of, of education outcomes. And, uh, you know, places like Mexico and Brazil in particular have tried, and, you know, to sort of, and by the way, in some places in the United States as well, they have been toying with this idea of it, should we actually pay parents for the delivery of better outcomes? So if your child has a 98% attendance record and gets a, you know, A plus in a, in a test, should we then give the parents, you know, call, call it what you like, $20? Now, you know, quite apart from the ideological debate, I'm sure there'll be many of your viewers who will just think I've gone nuts by even having this conversation. But the bottom line is that I think that those are the types of issues that public policy needs to explore. Um, and by the way, you know, if you look at Michael Sandel, Dell's work on you know what money can buy you you'll know that some of the outcomes are it's, it's not you know in pay an incentive and you get an amazing um, outcome even there the debate is is nuanced um, and you know as I alluded to a moment ago there'll be many people who will find that quite offensive you know the idea that we should be paying parents to do what we think they should be doing anyway but there is a uh, I would argue some so, sort of um, need for openness given the sort of severity of the problem I do think we need to be a bit more open less ideological about what might actually work in terms of deliverables. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with Dr. Moyle in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. 
The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I am with Dr. Dambisa Moyo, and we're talking about all kinds of economic issues. We've talked about some of the companies, and the companies you're on, uh, of course, four boards. Uh, yes. You're a director of four very major international companies. Um, let's talk about board diversification and, and what's happening, especially in the United States, in terms of women, people of color, uh, and, and whether you see progress and how important or is it or not. So g give me your take on that. So, you know, very simply put, the board and companies have to reflect the customers, the regulators, the shareholders, and, you know, boards that are not diverse, not just in terms of race, gender, and age, but also in terms of thinking, are, are just set to lose. I mean, you, you will not be able to, particularly in a globalized world, you know, where there's so much uh, geopolitical risk, so much, uh, so many changes happening in public policy, even domestically. If you have only the same type of person in the board, you will simply not be able to compete. So it's just as a pragmatic approach for success, for decisions of capital asset allocation, um, which is absolutely critically important from the CEO's perspective, but also just from really being able to figure out where your revenues are going to come from. Um, if you are a Coca-Cola company, for example, and you want to sell your product, if you only have a certain type of person in the boardroom and you have no visibility to what is happening, not just within the United States, but more generally, how are you going to sell your product? It would be absolutely impossible. And so, uh, you know, I actually wrote an article for Harvard Business Review on this issue because um, there are just so many challenges that global business did not deal with uh, a number of years ago, did not need to deal with, that have now come to the fore. Not only what you sell, but how you sell is going to define your, your uh, value proposition and the only way you can get around those issues is by having a broad and diverse um, uh, sort of a board and also management and, and team in general and that is, has to be as, as diversified in terms of its thinking um, as possible. So is, you mentioned Coca-Cola and diversity. I'm thinking <laughs> Pepsi-Cola and diversity. Yes, uh, same thing. I'm so sorry. I, I, I just happened to pick them out of a hat. No, no. I'm just thinking in terms of the, uh, you know, the leadership of, of those companies yeah. uh, in terms of diversity. So uh, when you look at, at uh, corporations as they grow and you look at government, uh, there seems to be uh, a lot of people complain about the size of government and efficiency of government. There are many companies that as they grow become very bureaucratic. Uh, and, and, and really, uh, I think there are often more parallels in the private and public sector than, than people realize. Talk about that in terms of how, do you, how does a company grow, uh, become a very large company, yet stay efficient? And, and give me your thoughts on how do we do that in government, where, of course, in many cases, it's even more difficult because the vast majority of people are civil service employees and essentially have the equivalent of tenure. Yeah, so, you know, fantastic question. I just reread um, William Thorndike's book called Out Outsiders, um, which is brilliant. Um, and essentially, just to, I, I don't know whether he would agree with this summary, but essentially it's eight, roughly eight case studies um, of the best performing CEOs. It's different sectors. Um, they outperformed the peer, their peers. They outperformed in, in their, within their sectors. They outperformed their, the benchmark. And the question is why? What did they do that made it so different? And the delineation that he picks out is that they are totally focused on capital allocation. So virtually every other aspect of running a business, things like operations, legal compliance, critical issues to a business success, are almost farmed out to the president of the company or to another individual. So that the, essentially the CEO's job is to show up every day at work and to think about where do they earmark that marginal dollar? Where is that one dollar going to? And he argues, um, if I'm not overstating it, uh, that that is actually the definition of the most successful or the, the backbone of the most successful companies. Um, you know, I would, I've never actually served in government, but I will say the following. There is a tendency, um, for sure, for people like myself who grew up in the private sector, um, but are nevertheless interested in public policy, to be slightly pejorative about government and you know its efficiencies, etc. But what they're contending with is an incredibly difficult set of competing interests, particularly in a democratic society where the, those those types of uh, of preferences are, are regularly expressed through the voting process. Um, what also what governments are contending with can be very very difficult. I was just. Um, in London 
and I happened to sit next to the head of the civil servants in service in Britain. They have approximately 400,000 uh, um, employees in the civil service there. The British civil service is one of the, the most renowned, uh, respected around the world. 400,000, and they've got approximately 420 tracks right now because of the Brexit agenda. And, you know, there are real issues around capacity. One of the biggest issues that they have to deal with is, is revisiting trade contracts. Well, the last time Britain had to deal with trade contracts was about 40 years ago. So where do you get the talent to actually negotiate contracts? These are very practical issues that government has to deal with on a daily basis. And coming to some kind of balanced sort of, um, you know, in a, in a sense, um, reasonable, measured judgment is not something that I would claim governments do lightly. And by the way, companies have to deal with that as well. You know, where do you put money today so that in 50 years' time, your successors will look back and say that was a smart decision um, or not? And so it's those type of challenges that may, on the face of it, seem quite easy, but actually, as a practical matter, are incredibly difficult and very subtle. Um, just to put a finer point on it, I, I'm regularly astonished at how it is some of these, these, these companies, they have you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people working for them in 60, 70 countries. You know, I'm shocked that through the globalization process and the number of things that could potentially go wrong, we don't have many more catastrophes. Um, you know, think bad stuff does happen because it's, it's the very nature of running such a complicated enterprise is challenging. Um, but the fact that we have actually seen, certainly for over 50 years, the success, uh, business success um, around the world, not just American companies, but global businesses, I mean, I think is something we need to, to pause and, and reflect on. All right, we're going to take our last break and we'll be right back with Dr. Moyle. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos and tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbour Show. Watch The Aaron Harbour Show. Watch The Aaron Harbour Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harper Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to our final segment with Dr. Moyo. Uh, and of course, this is part two of our special two-part series with this extraordinary leader, thought leader, among, among other things. Um, so one of the, we've been talking about uh, government, private sector. I'd be really interested in, in your take on, on ideas to make government more efficient in the context that, that, that you framed, which is government isn't business. Government's obligations are different. The structure in which it works uh, is different economically, politically, uh, et cetera. 
Um, and one of the examples that fascinates me is, is years ago, Senator Gary Hart called for uh, really a zero-based, essentially budgeting approach, approach for the Department of Defense. And if you look at the United States Department of Defense with roughly a $600 billion annual budget, on top of that, if you add the Veterans Administration and the Department of Energy, which handles nuclear uh, issues, you know, you're spending uh, about a trillion dollars a year. And so I'd be curious if you think, you know, are there ways if we were to set uh, priorities for what the department is doing. Uh, so if we were to set priorities saying, here's what we want to accomplish, might there be ways to, to do those things, not do things that we just keep doing because we do them every year, save money and have a better outcome? So um, you're not going to like my answer because I actually think um, very often issues around economics are really um, political problems that are manifesting themselves as economic challenges. So, you know, the suggestion that we need to focus on zero cost budgeting, etc. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that we should dismiss them outright, but I think that it, it reflects to me, these issues around efficiency of government reflects to me a more inherent, um, a more deep, deeply set question about how the government does its job. Um, and my, 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 it's not a proposal, but the thing that I'm really thinking about right now is whether part of the problem, certainly in the United States, is that you have too many elections. Um, government, if we think about the issues that the U.S. government is contending with today, or has to contend with today, um, everything from education, pensions and health care, um, the aging population, which is related to pensions, of course, um, environmental concerns, Virtually all of these aspects, infrastructure, are long-term intergenerational problems. And yet, so you've got a long-term agenda, and yet you have these short-term, every two years, you have an election. Um, it's just simply not enough time for a government to, it would seem to me, sit down and to plan and to come up with strategic thinking that matches not just the political and the economic, but also the civil servants with the politicians within the government. And I would argue that if you look at many other countries, and I think there's, you know, one of the things I'm working on right now is a book that's going to be looking at some of these issues. But if you think about how um, the, some other countries look at this, um, you know, other democratic places like Mexico, like Brazil, they've actually extended the term. So instead of having one four-year term for the presidency or um, two-year uh, elect, election six for two year years, term. you have one six-year term for the presidency, or in the case of the Senate, um, nine years um, in the Senate. Um, and I think there's something to be to be explored there. I think that um, one of the problems with efficiency is that there's just too many distractions, particularly in a 24-hour media cycle. Governments are constantly being distracted with things that I think are more short-term in nature, um, much much more reactionary, less opportunity for, the, for government officials to really think about the long-term structural problems. They're constantly trying to address and redress these, this is a barrage of short-termism. Now, we've, people talk about short-termism in the private sector, but I think that there's a, a very big issue um, in terms of myopia and short-termism in the government that the political uh, agenda could, uh, could address. Well, that's, I mean, certainly... Uh, that's Spicy. A, a fascinating solution, which, of course, would require constitutional amendments. Yes, but America's very good about at innovation. I mean, when, they, when they're going down a, a track that I think people can recognize or can get around and say, this is actually just doesn't make any sense. This is antithetical to what our beliefs are, and antithetical to progress and innovation. I think Americans can, can make a compelling case to do the right thing. And all I'm saying is that we do have a mismatch between what the problems are that are facing the United States and the political system, which is just far too short term. Um, and I think in many ways, it, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's due for an upgrade. Um, I'm not going to say that it's, it's a, a fail-safe. I mean, I think that there are other issues from having long terms. I mean, you could elect the wrong guy and he could be there longer, um, um, or girl for that matter. But uh, I do think that, the, uh, that, that there's something to be debated and discussed, whether there's this, this mismatch is a, as costly as I do believe it is. All right. Uh, staying on the topic of government and regulatory burden, what are your thoughts about uh, are there ways we could regulate that protect the public interest, that are more efficient, and reduce the burden on the private sector so that it's actually a win-win for everybody? Yes. My favorite example, thank you for asking. I did um, write about this in my uh, my. Uh, uh, one of my last books, my last book actually. Um, I think public pension funds uh, is a great example of this. So public pension funds are essentially designed for by us. We are putting money into public pension funds as individual citizens. 
I constantly find it, find it baffling that at a time where there's an underinvestment in infrastructure, so if you look at the American Civil Engineers uh, reports, I think they've graded America's bridges and roads as a D plus. Given that we know that, and given that those are long duration intergenerational assets, you, the pension funds naturally want to match their assets that they're holding with long term outcomes, because they're talking about um, uh, life expectancy, they're talking about the actuarial tables and long term uh, um, uh, life expectancy of, of citizens. It would be the natural thing for them to seek to invest those assets and that capital into long term duration assets, which long term assets such as infrastructure. Why is it that not, and by the way, that would be beneficial for us as citizens. We want to see better infrastructure. It's a good thing for society. It's a good thing for us. It's a good thing for, our, for generations to come. So it seems to me that that is an area where governments would naturally say, hey, you know what, don't invest in short-term stock movements all the time. Why don't you put a big chunk of your, of your assets, if not all, I mean, that would be quite racy, in to pension, uh, your pension assets into infrastructure. That would be an, uh, you know, essentially the proverbial win-win for, um, for society, but also you could generate um, some returns. Now there's a debate about whether those returns would be um, relatively low, but that might be on a dollar amount relatively low, but from a societal gain, in terms of how the utility of the society and human progress contends, uh, continues, I, I can't see why people would find that objectionable. Well, how would they generate that return? If I'm a pension fund, uh, I'm a teacher's pension fund, for example, I have billions of dollars, uh, the, the government wants to uh, improve uh, 100 miles of road and, and they're going to do a $2 billion project. They're looking for funding. How do I get a return on that? Well, it's not, first of all, it's not that there's zero return on, uh, on long-term investments. I mean, the returns do exist. Uh, but all I'm suggesting to you is that, answering your question, are there ways that government could, could um, regulate perhaps more efficiently in the public interest or public goods? Uh, that that I think where there are gaps. I think that's an example of where a gap is. Um, I do think that pension funds under pressure from short termism, under pressure from um, competing asset classes and uh, competing places where you can put your dollar in hedge funds or private equity, etc. Um, perhaps moved a little bit uh, away from what is that, the natural habitat of, um, of somebody who should be seeking long term returns and who actually could benefit the, the, the society more generally. All right, last set of questions. Leadership. What makes a great leader? What are the qualities of a great Gosh. leader? I, you know, I, uh, I think it's really about being able to dig in when the time gets tough. I, you know, I think a lot about this. Um, I also run marathons um, in my spare time, and I've, I've realized uh, that I, my better times happen when I dig deep, uh, and when the, the times, my, the times when my times are really horrible. Um, Not as bad as mine. <laughs> no, mine. I had a 636. Let me tell you, it was oh, brutal. Oh, I had a 606. Did you? We oh, okay, that makes me feel better. We shouldn't. <laughs> but um, you know, you know then that. There comes a moment where you can actually either quit and take a taxi back home. Or you I've had many of those. I asked the state trooper for a ride once. <laughs> Did you? Oh my God. No, I, I haven't done joking. that yet. I should do that. I'll hitchhike back to the end line. But anyway, the point just being that um, in, in a way, it, it, it seems to me, and this is very simplistic, but it's easy to manage something when things are going great. It's those first five miles in the marathon. People are cheering you on. You haven't, it hasn't yet hit you that you have another 21 And you're thinking, hey, I'm going to break four hours. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but really, it's about stay, you know, being less rudderless, if I can put it that way, um, being sticking with, the, with, the, with the, a, a, a specific goal, with a specific plan when the going gets tough. And the going is tough right now globally. And this is why, in a way, I think it's a little bit simplistic to just ditch globalization and pivot to other more protectionist, isolationist um, approaches, because that's, we know that's not going to work. It may look attractive in the short term, but we know longer term this is not the path to glory. So uh, leadership is about digging deep. It's about making very difficult choices and also being bringing people along with you. Um, you know, I, I'm going to guess you're going to ask me in a minute, who do I think is a great leader? I am. Um, yes. So, I mean, I, I, I've also uh, unsurprisingly been struck by uh, Winston Churchill. The idea that um, Chamberlain was very much against the war, you then have um, Churchill come in to convince a, a population that going to war, which seems a very negative societal thing, um, and to bring them along, it, was a very, it must have been a very difficult thing. Um, and to this day, I mean, that's why he's in the history books. 
Dambisa, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting me. I'm delighted to be here. It was my pleasure. Thank you. That was Dr. Dambisa Moyo. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.